Thank you for coming. I'm Johnny Delirious, Master Survivor, Recovery Pioneer, and Consultant for Sustainable Solutions. I've been a professional in the health industry for over 30 years, and if you'll allow me, I'd like to share with you about my story, my recovery of hepatitis, and good liver health. So please hold all your questions. I got more than enough material to cover and not enough time. So I'm excited that you're here. I was born in 1953 and raised in Northwest Florida. My father was a medical doctor and after teaching at Tulane, he moved to Northwest Florida, Fort Walton Beach, that's my hometown. And basically this was frontline medicine because rural Florida in the 50s and early 60s, it was, you know, he was the only doc in town, had his black bag, he did house calls. And, uh, you know, later he had his own clinic and started the county medical hospital, but he used to tell me that the patients who were always complaining the most were, they were the most difficult to deal with and they're always sick. He called them the young inadequates. You know, after that TV show, The Young and Restless. So my, my dad had a term for just about everybody and he called them the young inadequates. But, he, you know, so he would, you know, he, we'd hear some of the work he'd bring home just a little tips and bits and pieces uh, so but the patients who tried usually had a better chance to make it so I said to him to get well you have to work for it he said yes he said yes to get well he said the ones who complain were lazy the ones who tried my dad called them the fighters I'll never forget that so fight or not, when someone receives the death sentence from a medical doctor or an official, doesn't matter, usually there's a decision that's made. Deep down inside, they, there's a moment of clarity and they, they make that decision to live or to die. Let me explain. Most people just accept it and do what the doctor prescribes. And when they die, everybody says, well, they did all they were told to do. You know, they had stage four cancer. They could only, you know, regulate and, and manage the pain with drug therapy. So, you know, that's all they could do. Some people, though, don't decide to, you know, see a decision's always made. So when that decision's made, usually those people choose death. They choose death and they take it in their heart. I'm going to die. You know, I've got stage four cancer, but there's some that decide to live. There are some that decide to live. And if they decide they're going to live, they look at all of the possibilities instead of just one opinion from their doctor. And they will become desperate with an intense determination to seek the truth and find out all other possibilities they can to survive. People like our coordinator, Sue Vogan, you know, the first thing she heard was, I don't know what's wrong with you, but she wasn't feeling well. But because she's a fighter, she got other opinions. And one time, one doctor, about the third or fourth doctor said, maybe you're bitten by a tick. Maybe you've got this thing called Lyme's disease. Because she's a fighter, she seeked the truth. And she's with us here today. Thank God for the fighters. Thank God for Sue Vogan. Let me Let me tell you about my story. In 1969, I was a sophomore in high school. There was about five of us guys and four of our gals. We all came down with hepatitis A. Oh yeah, we were popular in a strange sort of a way. You know, we all had yellow eyes. It was probably from eating tainted oysters. Okay, there's a lot of articles in the newspapers uh, about tainted oysters with hepatitis A. I'm sure that's how we got it. Now, my dad was a medical doctor. I recovered faster than my peers. We were out of energy. We quarantined ourselves at home. They ridiculed us. They called us the mellow yellow crowd or you all live in the yellow submarine. I don't want to be around you, you know. But my dad says, stay away from the booze. Eat simple things, avoid the barbecue, fruits and water and lots of rest. So I said, okay, what about watermelon? He says, perfect. So all I did was really eat watermelon and just recuperate and rest it all the time. I was back in school in less than a month, faster than my peers. Now, interestingly enough, a year or so later, we all came down with hepatitis B. Oh yeah, we were the wild crowd. We wanted to feel good, but we all had good careers, worked hard, but we partied hard as well. So in the spring of 1970, we all came down with hepatitis B and I'm sure that my girlfriend was doing intravenous drug use. We were, some of us were rock and rollers. 
And, you know, again, we had the yellow eyes. Oh, God, there you guys go again, you know. And I threw away all my high school annuals. I didn't want to have, <laughs> I didn't like the comments. You all live in the yellow submarine. I was riding my annual, so I didn't save that. But I got over the hepatitis faster. And you could say that uh, I became an expert at an early age about the liver and hepatitis. Uh, in 1973, just a couple of years later, my mother came down and died from liver cancer. So the liver, hepatitis, that was a big deal to me. And um, in 1981, I had a non-A, non-B hepatitis. Oh yeah, we're gonna hear everything about Johnny today. Again, I ate watermelon, stayed off the booze, and, and basically from high school on, I basically won a big drinker. But you know, my crowd and us, we dabbled. Okay, as you can see, cocaine addiction cured. But again, I ate watermelon, got over it within a month or so. The energy came back, and we all pursued our careers. And uh, I did well. I uh, had lots of good jobs. By 1984, I was vice president and controller of Davenport Labs, a, a laboratory in North Dallas in Addison, a little town called Addison. And basically, we provided the elemental analysis of hair, urine, and water for over 489 medical practitioners. And from that analysis, we provided the dietary and supplement and uh, nutritional recommendations based on that analysis because that was the biological activity inside the patient. And so our client base grew, and most of them were medical doctors. I worked hard. I was wearing a suit every day. Uh, you know, I designed our own water test kit. We uh, did all the Dallas County School water fountains back in 1987. And in 88, we tested all the US Navy water fountains, which was a big contract. That was a big contract. And all, you know, when you consider all the ships and all the water fountains, that was a big contract. Uh, and I took everything to a higher level. I became chairman of the board. I was promoted. Uh, I was chairman of the lab. Uh, however, my life wasn't going so well. You know, the, the laboratory was top rated with the Clinical Laboratory Institute of America, but my life was going downhill fast. Why? Well, one reason why is the coffee that I was drinking all the time was burning my stomach, giving me ulcers. Um, I tried amphetamines to just get enough energy to keep working because this was an important job, you know, for a guy uh, that age. And, uh, you know, a highly professional field, and uh, started doing cocaine every day. <laughs> oh yeah, very stupid thing to do, but I started doing it. And there's one thing, you know, cocaine does, it's a stimulant. So a few lines of cocaine, I got dressed and got out of my house and got to work. It also wears off quicker than amphetamines or whatever, and after eight hours or so, I could get to sleep. However, cocaine is habit forming. <laughs> And I found out about that uh, the hard way. Anyway, my behavior was unbecoming. I heard things like, here comes my boss, the abominable snowman. There was an intervention in 1991. Got a knock on the door. There's my brother. I said, hey, how you doing? And he just points right in my face. He goes, you need help. Starts walking backwards doing the moon dance. He said, you need help. And out from the bushes, I came out, I said, what's going on? Out from the bushes came the men in black, threw me down on the ground, put that boot between my shoulder blades, and heard the screech on the radio, <laughs> unit one, <laughs> we got him. And these were SWAT team guys. My next stop was the mental hospital. Oh yeah. Well, before I was managing a laboratory, doing cocaine every day, now I didn't have the cocaine, I couldn't even manage a couch. I couldn't even watch TV. I couldn't even be a couch potato. I didn't realize that the Coke was keeping me going. It was actually, you know, keeping me functioning. They gave me all these tests. I took everything, the MMPI, inkblot. I, I never heard of inkblot until I, I did that. They said that I was normal. They said that I had a high IQ. But they also said after two months that I could be released if I agreed to a couple of things. And one of the conditions was that I'd go to Alcoholics Anonymous every day for about 90 days. Well, just for the record, 
I went every day for the next three and a half years. So just for the record, I've been straight and sober since March of 1991. And, you know, that's, that's a fact. Now, as you can understand, my family wasn't impressed by my performance. Well, I said, oh, I got a lap. Well, <laughs> you know, you're doing coke, you know. Well, all the time, I just realized that um, my energy was not coming back. Now, I went back to Jackson, Mississippi, where my brother lives, paid him back for the intervention, thanked him for the intervention, hugged him. Thank you so much for saving my life, blah, blah, blah. So paid him for everything. Still out of energy, he said, well, why don't you go up to the medical center, the University Hospital? Big research facility there in Jackson, Mississippi. I went up there and saw a head of gastroenterology. She's, I don't know, from Boston Medical or whatever. And I said, well, I need to get a liver profile. It's probably my liver. And it was. Hepatitis C. And my liver enzyme levels were off the chart. They're 1,800, where the normal reference range is between 20 and 40 for ALT, ASC. Back in those days, it was called SGOT and SGPT, which is high, really high. So she says, oh my gosh, we gotta do a viral load test. So the viral load test came back at 12 million. She goes, oh my gosh, you know, this is serious. And she, I said, wow, well, you better check cancer, you know, because my mother died of liver cancer. And so she did a biopsy. The biopsy came back at 96% scar tissue. She says, my God, if you've only got 4% liver function, we don't see how you're alive right now. You know, maybe six months, eight months, you might survive, but you've got to get a liver transplant. That's your only hope to survive. That's your only hope. Well, I think at that time, I read an article not too long before that about the baboon liver transplant. You know, it kind of went around. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. I don't want a baboon liver. She, you know, give me the research. Well, that really pissed her off. I guess because I, you know, I said yes to the, to the viral load measurement, yes to the, and then I said no, and put on the brakes a little bit. She goes, wait a minute, we're, we gotta do this. And I said, no, I'm a lab guy. I wanna see the studies. If you teach gastroenterology, you're head of the department, and you're, you know, this is university, maybe they have a textbook, give me the book. So she said, all right, come back in a few days, and you know, we'll have some materials, and they did. And they were very nice. And, um, you know, it's all about hepatitis C, which was new. It's all about liver transplants. It's all about interferon, what they call the cocktail. So I took it home and read it and studied it and, and went through it like a fury, with the fury of a wild, hungry dog finally getting his long-awaited meal. I mean, this was what I, if this is what I had to do, I wanted to know everything about it if they're going to take my liver. I don't know, you know, once you go under, the doctor has complete control. He might give me that baboon liver. So I just, you know, I, what I found wasn't too exciting. I, I, you know, I just remember a couple key statements that I'll never forget as long as I live. Oh, one was uh, patient B responded and rallied on year six and month four before he died. What a miracle. I'm like, a miracle? The guy died. There's no, I mean, he may be a medical doctor, but you know, he needs to go back to writing comp one. It's not a miracle, it's the wrong use of terminology. Then I figured out why he said that. Because back in 1992, most transplant recipients didn't live longer than five years. So yeah, it was a miracle because, you know, the guy that lived past year six was one of the few. I said, oh, wait a minute, if I get a transplant, I'm gonna die in year six for sure. And I don't like this. Well, what I read about the interferon wasn't that much more exciting. In fact, it was worse. Let me see. Oh, the patient could suffer flu-like conditions on the good days and suicidal thoughts are common. I'm like, on the good days? What about the bad days? Huh. Oh. I went back to my appointment. I said, look, I, I can't do this. 
He said, well, we, we got the transplant committee all together. We got a lot of paperwork to do. We got to really hurry. You're an old positive liver and, you know, old positive blood type. And so it's going to take us longer to get your liver. And I said, well, wait a minute. How much longer? I mean, you know, what's different? Oh, well, you know, O positive is the most common blood type. And, you know, there's more recipients for the most common blood type as there are for, the, and, you know, so it may take, you know, 16 or, or 15 or 16 months before we get your liver. I'm like, oh, well, well, wait a minute. You're telling me I've got six, eight months to live and I've got to wait 16 months? Uh, the math doesn't work for me. Oh, but we'll get you on the cocktail. We'll get you on the cocktail. And I said, well, wait a minute. I don't want flu-like conditions on the good days. I don't feel good right now. <sighs> oh, she got so mad at me. You know, and at that point, she started putting her hands on her hips and started pointing at me like this. And she says, well, we're working so hard to save your life. You're, you're too sick to make these kind of decisions. You're, you're not thinking right. You're just delirious. And I'm like, like this, and I'm like, like a brick hit me. And I said, well, and she said, what are you going to do? I said, you know, if you don't do this, what are you going to do? You're going to die. You're going to die. You're going to die. I said, well, I might do herbs, you know, milk this. She goes, herbs, herbs. Oh, my God, herbs. And at that point, I just said, i got to get out of here. I don't like these people. I, I mean, either way, you know, they say I'm going to die. If I do it their way, I'm going to die. I mean, it just, I mean, that's, okay, maybe I was delirious, but that's what was going through my mind. And all I could think of, you know, is that I was like I was marching off to the Civil War. It didn't matter whether you're from the North or South. They, we lost over 600,000 men. Just Gettysburg and Manassas alone had over, you know, more than Vietnam or Korea put together, just two battles. So it was a death sentence no matter what. I was the walking zombie, walking dead. So all I did, instead of covering my ears, I just stood up and I said, when Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah. And I just, I just was trying to get out of there, get away from them. They kept yelling at me and fussing at me. I get to the door. And I said, when Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah. And she says, all right, Johnny Delirious, you go outside that door, you're a dead man. You're going to die. Well, now you know how I got my name. She's head of gastroenterology, the expert. And I'm Johnny Delirious. <laughs> and I'm telling you, you know, I, I told the publisher when I wrote my best-selling book, Hepatitis C Cured, I turned in the manuscript and he said, well, you know, you could have a pen name, you know, like Samuel Clemens had Mark Twain is kind of descriptive. It measured the, you know, the plumb bob measurement of the depth of the river. Mark Twain's a certain measurement, about 16 feet, blah, blah, blah. I said, well, I do have a pen name, Johnny Delirious. He goes, oh, you've got to be kidding me. I told him what I told you, what had happened. He said, it's perfect. <laughs> he said, it's the perfect pen name. So I've been Johnny Delirious ever since. And I just have you know that, uh, I, you know, the cocaine didn't win friends and influence family, you know, uh, you know. And then when I turned down what the doctors told me, you know, I'm the youngest and, you know, my family and my sister said, well, you never did anything mama said either. You, you, you probably are going to die. You are delirious. I said, well, I love you too, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, that's the way it was. And everybody called me delirious. I was on my own. I was ostracized. Like I told a couple of you earlier to today, there's a lot of miracles and healing miracles, but most people, and that's great that they get help. That's great. You know, they mobilize the Kiwanis Club and they raise all this money and they get their transplant or, or you know, they raise money for Susie to get her mastectomy or whatever it is, but I had nobody. Everybody ridiculed me, ostracized me, and as soon as they heard the doctors called me delirious, everybody called me delirious. So, when I talk about my healing program today, it was what I found on my own. You see, they weren't giving me any choices, but I made my choice. Like I said, a decision is always made. And what I learned you know, from my dad and the hard way is that I choose to live, I choose to be happy, and I'm going to fight to survive. This is 80% of my program, and this is part of Johnny's 80-20 rule. Now, my terminology and my method of healing is not like anybody else, allopathy, homeopathy, or naturopathy, or anything else. 
So my age 20 rule is 80% making a decision to live. That's number one. If you lose that, you're not going to live. I wanted to keep my liver. I did not want the transplant. I'm better than that. I'm one of God's children, and so are you. Life is a gift. This is a temple. I, I learned the hard way how to take care of this temple. It's sacred. I don't see myself as a robot or an automobile where you just change out the carburetor and put in a new one. I wanted to keep my own liver. And so I decided to find my own way of recovery. And you know, I can't say it enough. Choose and live is a decision I made. And to be happy no matter what anybody said, and everybody's calling me delirious. This is the 80%. The other 20%, what is it? Diet, cleansing, and exercise. A raised immunity response. That's what everybody asks me about. Well, what did you do? Did you do this herb? or did you? That's only 20%, all these therapies. I researched far and wide seeking products, therapies, and techniques that would, one, not harm the body or the liver, and two, find which product and therapy that truly brought results. In short, my body became a test site for every product a remedy, protocol, uh, imaginable under the sun that might remotely work and help restore the liver. So, as a matter of fact, I wanted to see what was most effective at lowering liver enzyme levels and lowering hepatitis viral load because I knew if it lowered the hepatitis viral load and it lowered the liver enzyme levels, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that it raised my immunity response. So when I talk to these biochemists and everything, I said, look, forget about the carbon molecules and cell respiration. If it lowered my viral load and it lowered my liver enzyme levels, I don't care what happened. My liver, my, you know, immunity response went up, period. So Johnny to each 20 rule, I can't say it enough, is making a decision to live, being happy while you're fighting, becoming your body's best friend, and 20% was a diet cleansing and exercise that I'll talk about. So two years had gone by. Some progress was made. You know, it was January of 1994. I'd gone from 12 million to 5.8 million. You know, kind of like Frank Sinatra doing it my way, you know. I went from 1,800 to 4 to 500 liver enzyme levels. I nearly cut them both in half, but I hit a plateau. I wasn't making any more progress. January went by, February went by, March of 1994, April of 1994, still the same. I was still kind of doing the same thing, dabbling in this and that, but it wasn't moving. So I decided to check into the uh, hyperbaric oxygen clinic in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I knew that if I could get that hyperbaric oxygen and the oxygen forced into my tissues and into my liver, that my immunity response would probably go up because on burn victims and other problems uh, that Dr. Neubauer had, and he's one of the pioneers there at Lauderdale by the sea, he's gotten good response and their immunity system definitely went up. I said, got to do it for me. So I did. I went six days a week. And, you know, every time you go to a new place, you got to do all the new tests and they, you know, you start through the blood work and, oh, well, that may be their test, but we got to do ours. So, you know, they had my labs, you know, 5.8 uh, million viral load. And after the second or third week, uh, I got my test back. <laughs> it really wasn't no change. It, it was like 400, 500, same at liver enzyme levels. Uh, my, fi my, my viral load went 5.8 to 5.4. Big deal. No big change. So I was on the plateau. The worst place to be in liver recovery or any kind of disease recovery. When you're not making any progress, it's the worst place to be. Why is it so bad? Because you will lose the 80% when you're on the plateau. You will lose it because you start to doubt what you're doing is right. And you know, so those thoughts come in, oh, I'm probably going to die. And you're not wanting to live. You're not wanting to be happy. You lose the 80%. The plateau was lonely. I was desperately looking for that one lucky punch to end my fight against hepatitis, but nothing was working. I prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. Finally, I just got this simple answer. Why don't you just go to hospital? You know, if you're sick, you go to hospital. So I said, okay, I'll do that. So I decided to go to the Gerson Clinic. You know, the cancer curing people, the Gerson Institute. And they said, well, you know, 
you got to have a partner. I said, look, I'm on my own. I've been trying to cure myself from hepatitis. I've been doing Kung Fu. I've been surfing. I'm feeling great, but my liver enzyme levels are still high. My viral load is still 5.4. So I really like to do this, Gerson. She said, the only way we'll allow you to go is if Charlotte Gerson allows you to go because her father had, you know, started the Gerson therapy. Bless her heart. She called me up and she says, you know, I told her my whole story. She said, all right, come on. We'll help you. So I went out there. And again, I went through the whole set of tests. And <laughs> but what it did for me is, you know, I was doing everything on my own. And, you know, made service twice a day as a hospital. I got vegan organic meals. I got 13 glasses of juice a day. It was great. I get my blood test back after two and a half weeks. No change. I'm like, oh my gosh. Even one of the orderlies let me a surfboard. And I'd go out to the beach and I'd cry and pray at the beach, you know, with the surfboard and the sun coming up. And they even allowed me, since I wasn't a cancer patient, to go to the market every once in a while and eat beans. Because, you know, I was being a vegan. Uh, you don't, in Gerson therapy, you don't eat beans. So then I had a dream. I couldn't believe this dream I had. It was so profound and so real that I woke up in a sweat of joy that morning. And it was still dark. It was about 3 30, 4 o'clock in the morning. I turned on the lights. I said, oh my gosh. In the dream, I was helping a medical doctor recover from hepatitis, from hepatitis C in the dream. And I was telling him how to do it. And I woke, what got me in such a sweat is like, wow, if I'm helping a medical doctor, that means that I recovered too. And I knew it. I knew it in my gut. It was right. I got goosebumps all over my arms and legs and my, my everything was standing up. I knew I was right. And so immediately I put all the covers on my bed, put the chair in front of my bed. I took my briefcase with all the lab tests and all the things they gave me at the University Hospital on the right hand side of the bed. Uh, I mean, on the left hand side of the bed, I put all the things that I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt probably didn't lower my liver enzyme levels or viral load like the hyperic oxygen. It's a good therapy, but I put that on the left hand side of the bed. In the middle, I put the, the lab work, the blood work, and all the studies. On the right hand side of the bed, I put the stuff that worked each and every time, lowered my liver enzyme level and viral load. And I said, that's it. I'll just do just the right stuff, period. And I put it together in a whole new methodology. You know, being involved in Davenport Laboratories, I, you know, I upgraded our procedure manuals. My, the lab director, he said, no, this is good stuff. And he signed off on it. So I knew how important procedure and methodology is, especially when you're doing clinical laboratory work. I put it together in a whole, and I got excited, and everybody says, wow, what, you sure, you know, you've been depressed, but you're looking like you're feeling great. I said, I am, I'm going home. <laughs> Charlotte said, what? I said, I'm going home. And so I left. And so flying home on the plane, I had my calendar out for the next three months, what I did on the first Tuesday of the month, what I did on every Thursday of the month. I had it all planned out for three or four months ahead of time. What I did with the new therapy and how I do it, when I exercise, when I wouldn't, how I do this, you know, procedure and, you know, there's certain things that when I do my run and I figured that out because I figured what worked. In less than two months, this is the, you know, June of, of 1994, in less than two months I went from 5.4 million viral load to zero goose egg. Nothing, nothing, because I started, yeah, thank you. I started my new methodology, and a few months later, I got started to get normal liver in some levels. A few months after that, by the holidays, I got no antibodies of any kind of hepatitis. My liver enzymes were normal. It was the best Christmas present I've ever had. Now, even as late as 2006, I went back to the Ocean Hyperbaric Oxygen Center with Dr. Neubauer. And, you know, I was passing through on A1A, and I said, you know, I'll go in and see Dr. Neubauer. Hey, Dr. Neubauer. He said, man, you're looking good. I said, you remember me? He said, yeah, yeah. 
I said, well, I don't have hepatitis anymore. It's been eight years. He goes, my gosh, no, that's impossible. You still have antibodies. I said, oh, no, Dr. Neubauer. Uh, any blood tests I get now, they said I've never had hepatitis. He says, oh, that's impossible. I said, all right, why don't you give me a complete checkup? So he had my records real. He said, well, it's a good thing because we got Dr. Davigilis working here. He is a liver specialist, one of the tops in his field. He gave me a thorough exam, and Dr. Davigilis, Dr. Clark, and Dr. Neubauer all declared that I had a healthy liver in 2006, and I was 53 years old at the time. They even did MRIs. They couldn't find any scar tissue. I've been helping people for, recover from hepatitis for over 18 years, and many people don't want to take the interferon the second time, you know, because 40% of them don't respond to the interferon. So what are they going to do? I got off my plateau by getting the 80% back because once I had that dream, once I put it together, all the right stuff, I knew I was right. Yeah, I was happy. Yeah, I wanted to fight. Yes, I was, uh, you know, wanted to be my, my body's best friend. So today those programs are called the Delirious Recovery Program and the Cirrhosis Recovery Program. And what I do is different than anybody else. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more and a little bit deeper about that. The liver is a blood filter. And, the, and my terminology and the way I look at things is totally different from anybody else. So you're going to walk away, hmm, that's funny. He's kind of, no, I'm not crazy. I'm delirious. Okay, so let's get that straight. Okay, <laughs> the doctor says I'm delirious. So the liver is a blood filter. So every food, water, and air we breathe is going to be filtered by the liver. And that is why, uh, you know, and over a period of, of time, the liver starts to get bigger the liver starts to get bigger, it starts cramping out the abdominal space. So it, it doesn't even boil down to blood tests or chemistry anymore, it's simply a lack of space when they're suffering from GERD and acid reflux because the liver, when it starts getting scar tissue, it gets stiffer, it doesn't, it's not as flexible. So the colon, the stomach, and everything else can't you know, move around and churn like it used to because this liver is crowding everything out. It's simply a lack of space. And when you add hepatitis into the situation, it gets more complicated and digestive problems increase. Everyone asks me about vitamins, minerals, and what I learned is that most supplements are chemical. They are not nourishment, but they have a value in my program. I take vitamins and minerals only in accordance to the hair analysis results. This achieves balance to raise the immunity strength and to create good blood chemistry and healthy liver bile. This is the first line of defense, getting the body in homeostasis even while you're sick. It's that balance what creates good blood chemistry and it's that balance that creates the immunity response even when you're sick. So, every time you get a little bit better and you keep that balance, you keep getting a little bit better. It's just that simple. Now, if I want true nourishment, if I want more vitamin A, I get carrot juice. If I want more vitamin B, I get nutritional yeast and raw salads. If I want more vitamin C, I get lemons and limes. And you've seen me eat some lemons and limes while, during my meals. If I want more vitamin D, I get sunshine and co cod liver oil. If I want more vitamin E, I get wheat germ. And, uh, you know, that, that's true nourishment, whole food. In the beginning, with a high viral load and extreme scar tissue, meats and saturated fats should be at a minimum in the diet. Follow the protocol of hair analysis to create homeostasis during recovery. Eat more lemons and limes with the grapefruit and grapefruit at night. Later, after a few weeks into the program, add olive oil and apple cider vinegar to all your meals to increase bile flow. The liver governs the benefit of micronutrients, so healthy bile makes cholesterol and minerals beneficial. I'll repeat that. Healthy bile makes cholesterols and minerals beneficial. This is also a way to get toxins out of the liver while you're achieving balance and raising the immunity response. The Delirious Recovery Program consists of three categories, detoxification, rebuilding, and replenishing. The detoxification has two levels of cleansing. One's the macrobiotic and the other's the microbiotic. Now, these are Johnny's terms when I say macrobiotic. I'm not talking about the Japanese diet with brown rice. I'm talking about the whole body. 
macrobiotic cleansing, like going out and running 10 miles. That's the, the whole body is involved with that. Or, you know, doing frequency therapy or taking an Epsom salt bath, you know, the whole body is detoxifying. You can sit in the physioacoustic chair and the whole body's getting those sound waves. It's better than massage therapy because massage therapy works only on particular muscles, but this gets the whole body relaxed and reduced and detoxified. Whole body, microbiotic cleansing. The microbiotic cleansing are the minuscule systems, the microscopic processes like capillaries from the blood circulatory system. And you know, when you take B3 vitamin, you know, niacin, it gets that flush. And you go out and run 10 miles, the whole capillaries gets cleared out. You take uh, 714X injections in the lymphatic nodes, the whole lymphatics get cleaned out because those are microscopic channels. Where does it go when you run that 10 miles? It takes all those toxins, where does it go? Right down your colon. Into the villi that are microscopic villi in the colon. And those villi have to be cleaned microscopically for the lymphatics to purge the toxins and for them to reabsorb minerals and get the benefit from good nutrition. Microbiotic cleansing. The <clears throat> macro rebuilding is the gladiator diet. You know, at the Gerson therapy, most of it I didn't keep because you know, one thing I couldn't eat beans. So the gladiator diet is exactly what the gladiators ate. I mean, they ate, you know, the Roman legionnaires ate barley gruel and nuts and seeds. If they're in North Africa, they'd eat uh, millet and, and uh, and garbanzo beans, if they're in the east, they'd eat white rice and lentils or, or brown rice and lentils. So it's always nuts, seeds, and legumes, macrobiotic uh, rebuilding, which is the gladiator diet. And then the micro replenishing, I already told you about with the fruits and vegetable juices. This is the micronutrients that's so important to get the true nourishment. Now, the methodology again is Johnny's age 20 rule, putting it all together in the right way. Without the 80%, it's difficult for anybody to recover. Now, my cocaine addiction taught me well. And I learned to appreciate the circadian rhythm. I learned to appreciate the real function of the adrenals and what they do. Because every time the adrenals fire off, a little bit of cortisol comes out with it. If you're drinking stimulants and everything, I drive people nuts when I say, well, you know, you're probably on the plateau because you're taking stimulants like ginseng and coffee. Oh, but I got to have green tea. I said, no, I don't even take green tea, decaf. I don't do any of that. I learned that when you're dealing with very subtle immunity response issues to get rid of the virus, you have to get rid of some of those things that may be common in our folklore. It may be common in our habits, but in the dream, I told that doctor, I said, well, the reason you're on the plateau is because you're still drinking coffee. You know, I tell some other people, this nurse, I said, you got to stop that wine at night. It's just a little thing, but it kept her on the plateau and she's not getting better. The plateau is the worst place to be because you'll lose the 80%. So I do hard exercise in the morning to wake up. I do soft exercise at night to relax. By 1998, I was head nutritionist at Everman Natural Foods, a 14,000 member cooperative. Now, this, you know, I did all the health fairs on TV and radio in Pensacola Naval Air Station, University of West Florida. Uh, I, I had my own hepatitis support group for two years, at Wednesday at 7.30. What I saw was exactly what, what my dad was talking about. Some of them weren't young inadequates. They were uh, old inadequates, but they were dying. I heard you were going to talk on hepatitis C. And, and I mean, you could smell the alcohol in their breath. And they'd die a few months later. You know what I'm talking about. They didn't have the 80%. A decision's always made. And usually, those people give up because they're lazy. They give up because they took that death sentence right into their heart. And they didn't want to do anything else. But some people did recover. Some of them took just one or two of the 20% that I did in my recovery secrets and did them well, but they had the 80%, so they recovered and eventually got no antibodies. Now, my exact blueprints are in Hepatitis C Cured and Cocaine Addiction Cured. It's a biography. This is a biography of my restoration of of getting rid of uh, restoration of the liver and getting rid of liver health. What I'll do for you, this is $20, but you can get the French book, Hepatite Gouret, 
Corrado de la Hepatitis in Spanish, or, or Corrado, uh, Hep C. Corrado in, in Portuguese. You can have those books for free. I just have to get $20 for my English book. So you can have any of the rest for free, but $20 for this book. It's my true recovery. I want everybody to read it. I'm, I'm so honored to be here before you because this is my story. Cocaine Addiction Cured is a biography. And to help with the 80%, I found something amazing that I wish I had because it wouldn't take me so long. And that's the uh, vibroacoustic uh, sound wave therapy, which we have the chair. Because after a few sessions in the vibroacoustic, you know, in the chair, in the fibroacoustic chair, all of a sudden, you know, FDA approved it. It lowers tension, increases blood flow. It, get, it, it all of a sudden you get a positive attitude because it shows such promise with post-traumatic stress syndrome. All of a sudden, the eighty percent gets back, and some of them say, "Gosh, you know, if you recovered, maybe I can too." I said, "That's right. You sure can. That's what the eighty percent is making a decision." To help with the 20%, I have the Delirious Recovery Program and the Cirrhosis Recovery Program. It's also available you know, online, and I have 14 uh, coaching videos about it. I believe that the liver is our most important organ. It gives the nourishment of good blood chemistry to our brain and to our heart. With heart attacks the number one killer, I believe the cause is poor liver health. As the liver physically gets larger from storing toxins, the quality of blood chemistry goes down. My program helps shrink the liver, get rid of the virus, eliminate the toxins and the scar tissue and get well. If you're a fighter, you can recover from any liver disease no matter what genotype of hepatitis you have, no matter how high your viral load or how much scar tissue you have. Fighters get well, lazy complainers don't. In the last six years, I've helped mostly professionals recover. The dream was prophetic. I've helped, I've helped medical doctors recover. I've helped nurses and dentists and lawyers. They're very serious about it, and they have the 80% because they have practices. They have families. They don't want to lose it. And they're very serious about anonymity, and so am I. I said, well, I'm not telling anybody. You can tell them you're working with Johnny Leary. So I'm not going to say that. I said, oh, good. We're on a good good point there you know so nobody's gonna know nothing you know you're safe with me and it's happened and, and you know I've gotten my best response from the medical doctors I love them and then when I start talking to them about the lab and my dad and everything it just you know they're friends of life you know when when you help somebody get no antibodies and nobody else can do that they're your friend for life even when I did all that cocaine, you know, some of those invited me to Christmas and Thanksgiving to their house. That's amazing. So maybe I lost it at one time, but I got it back. I got the respect back. In the last six years, I have helped them, and the secret of my program is my methodology. Putting it all together in the right way. Methodology is everything. You've got to have good methodology because they say, oh, I did that. Oh, I did that. Well, they're still on the plateau. They didn't do it the way I did it. Good liver health is a dedication. It's a commitment. It's a celebration and a new resurgence of the Hippocratic Oath that everybody should take. Do thy body no harm. Food is thy medicine. So don't give up on life. Don't be lazy. Remember what Johnny's always said, that natural recovery from hepatitis is a choice, not a myth. So make that choice right now. Become your body's best friend and fight for good liver health. This is the end of my talk. You've been a very attentive audience. I'm willing uh, so much to help and talk to any of you and answer any of your questions. I am Johnny Delirious, master survivor and recovery pioneer and consultant for sustainable solutions. Thank you so much.